Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Thriving Doctors podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Mio. Welcome to the show, Mio. Looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you so much. Yeah. So healing, what does healing mean to you? I think healing, well, the word comes from the word whole. And so much of healing is I think, you know, from from the paradigm that um, I found most helpful is seeing it from the framework of, of becoming fragmented or losing parts of ourselves. For example, in recovery programs, um, there's there's this idea that there's something that there is to recover. And that is kind of the the whole the whole self. Um, I operate from the philosophy that there is some part of us that can't ever be hurt, that stays pure and innocent, no matter what happens to us in our lives, no matter what we've endured or things that we've done. There is something, um, some people call it the witness or the observer, but something maybe of our essence. And so it's sort of trauma or the things in our lives that have that have hurt us those things block us from remembering maybe some people call it the original child of who we truly are and so to me it, healing is really doing the work to connect to to us the way the way we really came out yeah yeah, I, I I subscribe to that view as well. Oh, great! Uh, you know, um, and uh, I think it's kind of hard. It's it, historically that's been hard to grasp, right? Um, but uh, as I, w w one of the areas that I think helps crystallize this this essential part of us, and by uh, essential we mean our essence right the bit that can't be hurt is this um uh, internal family systems have you come across this have you come across this yeah yeah. yeah yeah so um he he talks he, he so he takes um mixes psychology uh and spirituality for one of a, a Better words, a uh, better word, or our essence. Could you um, could you explain how you you see that, um, and that might help the that might help the listeners differentiate between our our our, our parts and 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 the and the uppercase S self whole. Do you mean in terms of spirituality? I, I mean in terms of maybe better making a better job of describing what. Uh, Dick Schwartz's work is about than I have. Well, I'm not super super familiar with Dick Schwartz. Um, we did a little bit in my training um, with Gabor Mate's Compassionate Inquiry and their uh, very close colleagues. Yeah, my understanding is that there are different parts of the self, and he categorizes them in a very specific way. I think there's like a manager, and um, and it's it's all about bringing those uh, different parts of ourselves into coherence and into balance. Um, especially in our culture, we tend to extract and isolate. And so in neuroscience, with a lot of the, the work that I've done with therapists, it's, it's about taking those, those parts of the brain, those uh, like sort of clusters of neuro connectors that tend to isolate when we've experienced trauma and integrating them back into the the whole and so i my understanding is that internal family systems is is sort of that with with all of the parts of the self yes yeah um what helped me uh greatly on this last year was being uh, was was differentiating between um, our maybe psychological healing and essential healing, 
right? Or, or spiritual healing. So our psychology healing, that might go on forever. That that's that's the bit that keeps on going on. But the in terms of our essence or looking at spiritual healing, that is always and remains uh, ever forever whole. So until you put until I put sort of psychological healing and spiritual healing t together uh, and separate uh, putting those two things together in the set in the same conversation uh it it, it didn't make it didn't seem to make much sense to either me or anybody else that uh that I, I that I talked about so we're talking about a, a psychology that changes and an essential self that never changes and it, it's not wounded our, our our wounds are psychological rather than spiritual well it's interesting and and maybe it's a matter of semantics and and just the fact that our language doesn't have enough nuance but i have been thinking a lot lately about spiritual trauma um and and maybe that would be relegated to the area of psychological trauma in in the way that you're framing it but just the way that people are raised in certain religions and certain things are conflated for for young children and shame and fear and toxic toxic spiritual beliefs um yeah i think I think that can be really devastating. And I've seen a lot of adoptees um, like myself when I was younger, really kind of swing the pendulum all the way to the other side and, and just sort of live life as a, as a hardcore atheist because that feels safe. Um, if you've been introduced to a God that is uh, not so friendly and not so interested in your <laughs> well-being. But I, when I talk about holistic or whole healing, um, I do include the spirit. And I do think that that is something that separates modern medicine from every other tradition that's ever existed on earth. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, yeah, when I say spiritual healing, I'm, I'm talking about essential stuff, not uh, not any religion or, or or dogma so yeah sh shame would be uh, uh, to, shame would be perhaps psychological or emotional um what what we're doing at the moment is uh what i'm working on i have been working on for the last three four months or so is exploring this healing with fellow adoptees and looking at healing on five five different levels so psychological um emotional um bi biological and, and and physical which we might come on into a minute given your story um social and, and, and relational uh, and then spiritual or essential or, or what what we're working on uh, a meeting with uh, about 14 15 or so um adoptees this friday um, and we are going through uh, my what I've brought together on from the conversations I've had, from some questionnaires that have been filled in, and from my own um, my own work. And we're looking at the psychological healing out of the one of the five, bearing in mind, obviously, you've got to look at it holistically as well. So we we'll look at it holistically, and um, but and, and then also break it down into those in, into those five healing, uh, five healing healing levels. So basically, what we're doing is we're demystifying, we're demystifying what healing is. That's great. Some of what you've experienced um, with your, uh, your your physical healing and well, holistic healing. I'm sure you um, uh, would. Is, isn't very easy for our minds to grasp, right? Yeah, the mind is um, very limited, for sure. 
Yeah. So can you talk about, because there's um, some, uh, there's, a, there's a holistic area, but there's a lot of physical healing that you had because you had this condition mm-hmm. didn't you for three years, I think, if I remember rightly. Um, so was it a bit longer than that? Uh, since 2013 or 2010. Yeah, it's 10. been 13 years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Maybe. Uh, so um, I, I I was I saw a bit that talked about being bed bound for maybe three years. So maybe yes, that's why. Yeah, I was bedridden for three years, and I was in a very wow. serious wheelchair for about five. Wow. Wow. So could you tell us a little bit of of that uh, that that story and the holistic um, the the holistic, holistically and, and look at the physical stuff as well? Could you share a little bit about that? Sure. I was working at Harvard um, for a uh, an MD, actually, who is also a sociologist. And one day I woke up in extreme pain and I could barely move. And it just stayed that way for years. Uh, I went to quote unquote the best doctors i was living in cambridge so i was with all the harvard hospitals and so forth and for six months um i was being put on medications for things like rheumatoid arthritis and um and i really wasn't heard when those things weren't having any impact except for negative impacts of the side effects but luckily i had i was a researcher there in some capacity and After six months, someone said, you know, you kind of have to become your own doctor. This very old, wizened uh, woman told me that. So I thought, well, yeah, it's not like I can't do the research and I have access to all these resources. So in less than two hours, I I found my diagnosis and I went in and got the blood test and it came back and I was right. So after that, and it was scleroderma, uh, very serious autoimmune disease. And it was so it was so aggressive. It was it was sort of supernaturally aggressive. And so I was given five years to live, but in my body I had probably about two or three. And it they don't have they don't know much about it. It's pretty rare. It's in the lupus, rheumatoid arthritis sort of family. And it hardens your tissues, your connective tissues. So everything, you know, your muscles, your tendons, your skin, scleroderma means hard skin in Greek. And there, there's only treatments. There's no cure in the Western paradigm. Uh, they basically g- gave me morphine and, you know, any Percocets and Oxycot, you know, anything to, to treat the pain. So after years of, I mean, I lived in a nursing home, I lived in a hospice, I went to, you know, then I was uh, sent home to sort of just die, um, die at home. And I came across a different way of thinking about um, what the West calls psychedelics. And it never really appealed to me before. Um, But a friend had me listen to a podcast with a man named Chris Ryan. And he's a, a psychologist. And he recommended to me to drink ayahuasca. And so I did. And I started walking again and started getting better. And then I ended up going through an ayahuasca retreat with Gabor Mate and learned a lot about the mind-body connection. And that's really when I started making big gains. Yeah. So what presented as a physical thing became a mind-body thing on, on the back of that um well yeah yeah well you know what was really interesting was that first time that i drank ayahuasca actually it it opened up a spiritual dimension for me uh and when i began to understand my illness as a spiritual illness which is what these other medical paradigms often do frame it that way that took me in a whole other direction. Yeah, uh, interesting because it it it's um, this uppercase S self that Dick Schwartz uh, talks about, and which you're talking about here, 
it, it it's something that it's more of an experience than it is an abstract concept. Um, and we we can touch we can touch I think we touch it in different different touch it in different ways. So I actually touched I'm doing some uh, somatic experiencing with that. Um, uh, uh, and we're just drinking mint tea, right? When I do the somatic experience, but on on my second visit, my second somatic experience, I really touched this uppercase S self sp- space, um, and it's a spence, uh, It's a space of uh, a, a, a openness and tranquility with a bit of a uh, you know like uh, uh, um, almost like I, it was really it was really weird for me who somebody uh, who 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 makes uh, spends his day with words right and, and I, I don't always get the words out I, I sometimes stumble over my words but before I did this I was in publishing for many years but I it, it was a actual it, it was a, a a break from words it was a break from concepts it was uh, it was a, a a place it was a lived experience for me um, a, a lived experience of, of the uppercase as self rather than a, rather than an abstract concept and uh, you know watching some of your uh, watching some of your videos and there's there's links as always listeners there's links to uh, Mio's website in the uh, in the show notes. Um, you're interviewed for a Netflix. Uh, you know, inter- interviewed for a, a Netflix documentary on on healing, which I watched, and you you talked about how that process helped you with an adoption trauma and other trauma from your youth, as well as the scleroderma. So could you paint a bit of a picture of that for us, please? Yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult to, you know, these paradigms take us to places that are sort of hard to, to bridge with our culture because they're so different. It's, you know, you become a bit of a translator saying, you know, this word, I don't, there it doesn't fit into this other language, but I I talked with a guy who um, did early ESP studies with for the U.S. government uh, back in the back in the day, and that that has since been declassified. And he was talking about how there are two different definitions of magic. There's the magic that means fantastical, impossible, and there's the magic that's just extremely advanced technology concepts science that we simply can't explain and so you know we can imagine handing an iphone to somebody from the 1800s and that that would be magic um not impossible but impossible for that time but uh, a logical consequence of what unfolds from that time and so when i look at these plant medicines and how they, what they've done for my healing, I really do see them as extremely high level, super advanced technology. When I just think about their relationship, for example, to light conversion, it is the most uh, efficient transformation of energy that exists. I mean, it's very intelligent. And so with my adoption, on the level that I think people speak publicly, about such things. On a therapeutic level, um, I was really sort of able to to come to terms with a lot. Uh, I I received a lot of insights. One difference, I think, between domestic adoption and uh, transracial adoption is that for transracial adoptees, race is the big thing. And things like deportation and trying to manage the frustration of foreign governments. It's, we don't just get to deal with oh, I lost my birth mother and, you know, all that sort of uh, ground, you know, we start in the basement, not on the fifth floor kind of thing. And so I think it it really revealed to me the extent of my own colonization 
you know, I mean, I'm on the phone uh, doing a job interview and they call me in and they're looking for some, you know, white person. I, you know, I was renamed, you know, that happens in colonization and my body. And so regrounding me and recentering me in my own indigeneity was really significant. And also I eventually went back to my country of origin and felt that real separation again um that was probably as deep as the separation from a birth mother you know i couldn't understand what anybody was saying i couldn't communicate with anybody but yet getting to that sort of primitiveness of the smells and again that somatic uh dimension that you were talking about there was a lot of heartbreak there and the support from the plants and the healing that was able to happen there was very important. And also connecting with my um, ancestral bloodline in a way that uh, exists in wisdom traditions. And it, you know, may sound kind of woo woo to people in our culture, but I received a lot of information from the plants that eventually did lead me to meeting my birth mother and it, again, it seems very woo-woo, but I, so much information that I was given from the plants in sort of um, a visionary or perhaps ESP type of way was confirmed when I met her in person. And so that's what science is, right? You have a, you know, hypothesis and you kind of hold on to it and then you test it out and you're like, damn, that was real. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think the wisdom of of how to process these, you know, you can't go into battle without <laughs> any tools or any protection. And so I think it really set me up to where I could face some really big truths about how I came to be and really gave me a much more expanded framework and perspective than I was offered by the West that really allowed me to take in and not just take it in, but also release it. Um, just the, the incredible trauma that led to the biggest um, break in biology, you know, that between a birth mother and her child. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the word wisdom a couple of times, and you mentioned the word uh, woo woo, um, we like woo woo here, right? This is this is a place where we can do a woo <laughs> if we want to do woo woo. We do woo woo, um, but I, I guess w w what it seems to me is you're describing a difference between wisdom and logic, um, and uh, and we can un we can understand that in a Western culture, the difference between wisdom. And logic we can't quite put our finger on what wisdom is but we know what it is when it comes to us right um and uh it is uh what well, I'm, I'm struggling for a question here but um divers into let, let's take a dive into the into the woo woo um we're, we're friends here right we're not <laughs> we're not um we're not gonna fall out about this you've got a full <laughs> to go as woo woo as you like um, can you can well maybe you can maybe you can make that bridge that i can't make i'm struggling uh, the the bridge between wisdom and, and woo woo you know when you said the word logic it made me think about how we all know that there are different kinds of intelligences y you know there's like an academic t intelligence there's being very good with your hands and being like craftsmen or something like that. And, and there, there are different kinds of logic as well. There's, uh, you know, there's the, the logic that you study in college, you know, you take reason and argumentation or that you use when you're going to become an attorney or something like that. There's also emotional logic, which I think takes actually a more refined intelligence. Uh, so people who live in that sort of first logic, they often can't understand what people are doing, why people are doing the things that they're doing because human motivation tends to come from the emotions, emotional need. 
And so it's like, wow, they're they're not acting rationally. And it's just like, yeah, they are. They're, they're just uh, operating from a place of emotional logic. And then I think there's um, a, a sort of spiritual logic as well. I haven't thought about it a whole lot, but these are things that exist in in wisdom traditions where they think in terms of multi generations and they they really zoom out and they think of humanity in terms of thousands of years not 24 hour news cycles right and they also don't think of us in a vacuum they think of us in a web of relations of insects and plants and you know everything in between um, even things that we may think, like I, I remember reading about the Druids or when I was in Wales, maybe learning about the Druids and or the, the Celts, I'm sorry. And uh, they they talked about how, you know, every everything was alive. And this is sort of general paganism. And and so, you know, they named their houses. And if they bump into a table, they'll, they'll apologize to the table because it is a living uh, thing with consciousness and sentience. And so when you move into that level of consciousness um, where everything is alive and it's such a paradigm shift and I don't want to pretend that I um, have, you know, even come, come close to mastering it or even, you know, stepping into it fully, but everything shifts and, and I think wisdom ultimately comes from having the depth of like you know if you could have like the consciousness of of like the grandmother of the universe or or something like that and you know just from that that egoless place from from that really deeply intelligent space that isn't um wed to any particular time or culture to really try to see what underlines everything uh, so that everything can exist. But I think that if you are stuck in that, there's only logic and there's only this one particular kind of, you know, rationalization um, that, that keeps people sort of trapped in the West and in what I kind of call sometimes the superiority complex of modernity then you miss it. And really it's about looking at the results because who's getting sick and creating all of these crazy new illnesses that are the result of modernity um, and who's who's well. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there. Um, when you talked about the different intelligences, I thought back to an interview I did with a lady whose name has just gone out of my brain. <laughs> um, uh, she's from Harvard as well. Uh, Gillian Bolte Taylor. Have you come come across her? Jill? No, not Gillian. Jill. Jill Bolte Taylor. She is a neuroanatomist, and um, she's not a, a, an adoptee. Um, but I I listened to her book and I thought it was fantastic. So I, and she came on the show and she talks about left brain and right brain. So she basically she had she had a left brain stroke. And mm -hmm. the left brain is where all our language is. Oh, did uh, she do a big TED talk a long time ago? She did do a big TED yeah. talk. Okay, I'm aware of her. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know she was that woman, actually. Yeah. She um she did it. She had a left brain stroke. So all her logic, all her language went, all her logic went, and all her um yeah all her trauma went because mm -hmm. the left brain wasn't operating anymore so yeah. different intelligences one way of looking at different intelligences is is, is is a way of looking at left brain and 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 right brain and um we in the it's a mass oversimplification listen to the podcast um, and read the book um whole brain living if if you're interested in it, listeners, um, because I'm, it, it's more, it's more complicated than left brain and right brain, but we won't get into that here, but it's different intelligences. And then as I also thought about other, another take on intelligences, 
we talk about so in the in the west we are dominated by the left brain thinking whereas the expansiveness and openness and connection is all found in the right brain um different sorts of intelligence you know in the in the west we um we worship uh, iq right in, in you know we work at, we worship uh, intelligent uh, our logical intelligence quotient uh, when there is also um Emotional intelligence, obviously, and there is uh, people talk about that a lot. Uh, people also, some people talk about um, spiritual intelligence too, like you mentioned. And I think there's another one, like physical, physical intelligence too, if I'm oh, right. Absolutely, yeah. which yeah, is very, the, the somatic dancers. stuff. Yeah, high level dancers and athletes and yogis and all that. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. One of the things that adoptees often talk about, and I know that you're involved in uh, writing and you're a writing coach, a writing doula, which I thought that was a beautiful, <laughs> especially in you know, helping uh, helping an author give birth to their book. I thought it's fantastic. She's a, a, a writing a writing doula, listeners. I've never met one of those before. Um, so um, uh, what was this statement? Yeah, so people talk about writing um, uh, and writing, uh, uh, writing and creativity their right brain activities people talk, and so that helps people it, it's not it's not just the um surfacing of all the emotions and getting them on paper or getting them on the computer that helps us heal it's actually the right brain side that using the right brain and the creative side helps us heal by writing artwork um and also you know when we're using when we're dancing uh you know nobody dances for a reason do they uh and um i'm, I'm thinking that i used to do that in nightclubs you know uh, when i was single but no it didn't work right it, it wasn't uh, uh, dancing didn't get me anywhere that's it um but again we're switching off it's we, we, if we're dancing we're switching off from logic and we're in the um we're in the zone, aren't we? We're in we're in the we're in the moment. Our our, our trauma is a million miles away, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the brain is um, in general. The mind is really useful in dissecting um, and and processing, but it's always processing in a really specific way, and it's impossible to really be present and have a full experience you know i mean what's the biggest issue it's your mind and your thoughts getting in the way um and so i think the the order my friend dan has this hilarious joke where he says uh, as my father used to always tell me when it comes to a murder suicide the most important thing to remember is the order <laughs> and i i think with I think with the brain, um, and and these are also in wisdom traditions. I there, I remember in in undergrad we laughed because we were told that the ancient Greeks thought that the brain was um, in the center of the chest, and we were like, no, stupid, that's where the heart is. But I since then I think what they were really saying was they were identifying um, the most intelligent part of the human. It's the it's the, the heart is so intelligent and uh, the brain can really own, only understand things in terms of it can only really process reality by bifurcating it and having it having everything in two camps, whereas the heart can hold space for contradiction, what what may be intellectual contradiction, contradiction, the heart can hold all of it and I think slowly um, the West is seeing its intelligence and its power, but the the mind really wants to be the horse, but it's the cart. And when it's in service, I think of, of the wiser part, that's when it does a lot of good. When it, when it tries to take over, um, that's when you get the world that we live in now. Yeah. Can, can you relate this to, to the healing question? 
what you've just been talking about. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, can you um, yeah. remind can, me? Can, can you relate what you've just been sharing to the healing, to, to the, the, the healing question, the healing topic? Oh, the healing topic. Um, yeah, the way we talked about is whole. Healing doesn't happen from the neck up. Even if you're struggling with, for example, you know, a, a, what, what the West will deem a, a mental illness, um, a pathology of, of the mental faculties, it's always holistic. It's always uh, somatic and uh, spiritual, emotional, et cetera. And this is, this is part of where Gabor spoke to me, um, thinking about the autoimmune system, for example. He talks about how when you suppress emotion, you are also suppressing your autoimmune system in some way. Everything that you do is always happening on multiple levels. And again, the West likes to extract and isolate, but that if you don't service the whole context and the whole web of connections in only one small little part, um, you're still going to be vulnerable and sick in some way, even if you're functioning, you know, even if you're better. And also in, in indigenous traditions as well, just having that wider view and something that I find really freeing, I've never really thought of it until now in this way. What I, what I think is so freeing about being in the indigenous model is that there really isn't stigma within the spiritual realm. I always think it's really interesting how, you know, outwardly, in, in the public sphere, if people talk about spirits and prayer and all that, you're, you know, everybody's supposed to say, no, science, and that's stupid. But whenever you actually ask people, you know, when you pull people quietly, um, they do, you know, believe there's life after death, overwhelmingly. And they do believe that they sometimes, that people who have passed, um, who they loved, are communicating to them. And so there is this sort of like, contradiction again between the head and the heart between like this wiser knowing and um you know the the rationalized sort of scientized uh brains uh left you know in in that model left brained uh dominant paradigm so yeah i i find i think that it's very freeing to be able to both talk about things that are really stigmatized spiritually in our culture, in the in the indigenous wisdom traditions, but also at the same time, not fall into what I would call the woo woo, or sometimes I call it LA shamanism, which is it's it's really grounded in in something very ancient. It's grounded in a lineage that traces back. It's traced it. it it's grounded in. Um, experience and di discipline you know these these shamans are the most disciplined people I think in many ways on the planet um, just to be able to to do that level of work and hold that level of space but it's not it is cultural but it's something that they live I, like I'm moving out of the country but I I don't know if it's possible to live it here and I don't even know if it's possible to live it in the modern world. Yeah. Um, the um, I've watched if I, I bought a, a bought a course with um, a bit like a video online course with um, uh, there was audios as well, but it called called the wisdom of trauma. I mentioned it a couple of times on the podcast, I think, but um, I, I love that title for a start, you know, the wisdom of trauma, you know, when do you ever see trauma and wisdom put together and you're smiling and I'm smiling. It's like, no, you know, trauma's the, trauma's the big baddie, you know, it hasn't got any wisdom in it. Um, and, and, and I, and I love, I love parts of, of what I heard. Uh, and 
you know, like uh, on your website, you've got a, a testimonial from uh, Gabor Marte. I thought, wow, she, um, this is brilliant stuff. Mia must know, really know her onions, as we say in the UK. Um, and, and and I loved it. Uh, and But on one level, it seemed to be trauma education rather than healing education to me. And yeah, I, well, you know, Gabor is a doctor. He is a trained physician. And, and I think that we all kind of stay in our lane, right? Like, I mean, I, I don't read Western philosophy, for example, uh, for solutions. I read Western philosophers because I think that they are the great diagnosticians of the West. So I think that they're, the healing process to me, I think of it as uh as sort of two stages. There's one where you need to know someone smart in the prison who can tell you how to get out. But that person isn't going to be the person that can help you thrive outside of the prison. That takes a different teacher. And so there are people who can really help you understand why your life is upside down, why this culture is upside down. And Gabor is so articulate in, in that. But for me, the sickness is really the West and modernity in many ways. It's called Watiko in, um, in some way, you know, just the spiritual virus. But to actually really, not just to treat or understand your sickness, but to really actually step into healing, I really do think we have to step out of this culture. It's interesting you say that because as I was listening to you, I was thinking about what you said about the the scleroderma, right? You said you had to become your uh, own doctor. Yeah. And um, it, it, is, that, is that what we have to do ourselves? We have to become our own healer. I, you know, I, I have this coaching practice um, and, but whether or not I'm working with someone who's, who's using plant medicines or writing a book or coming for some sort of transformational coaching, to me, the key is always, this is the recovery of self that we were talking about, where you have to step into your own authority. You have to step into your own agency. That's where the healing happens because everyone's path is unique. And I think the healing is actually in the uniqueness of that path. And we emphasize what I call maps. Um, you know, maps can be IFS, it can be Gabor's uh, approach, it can be, you know, all these different, it can be Buddhism, it can be Christianity, it can be anything. But the focus is actually fixing your damn compass because if you have a compass that is calibrated, then all you need to do is walk north. And it's not about finding the right map because you can't live anyone else's life and no one else can really live yours. It's about really understanding that you have come here to be a cartographer. And to have that agency and that support, you find your fellow travelers and that's that's where the healing is. You you get to find your tribe, and you can't find your tribe if you are putting on, um, you know, false personas and things like that. And it's hard to come into your authenticity because you you've already sort of built this life, in in some way by being a false version of yourself, and so you lose people, but you also gain people, and you also create a natural filter for yourself where when you're being who you really are, um, you don't waste years being friends with someone who are, aren't really into uh, the thing that you've been hiding. Yeah. What, what I got as I was listening to that, I was, you talked about IFS and I was thinking, cause I'm listening to um, the No Bad Parts book on audio at the moment. Uh, and, it, it, it's his Dick Schwartz's uppercase S self. 
is like a wise parent. Yes. And and, and the, the the parts are the the, the kids that are st stuck where they got stuck. Um so stepping into our authenticity, the authenticity is what Dick Schwartz calls the uppercase as sap. Well, it's it, it you you when we started off, you described it and then you said, and it it, it it's known as different things, right? So what do people there's a saying about this? The Tao that is point at, pointed at is not the Tao, is it or something? There's a word, like it's the, the the word is just a metaphor. It's a placeholder. We've all got a different placeholder. So Dick Schwartz's placeholder is uppercase S self. Um, other people would, you know, other people might call that consciousness. Uh, that might be their placeholder. Um, yeah, you, you're smiling. Um, uh, what else do people call it? What what do they call it in that, in those ancient? It is the Tao, isn't it? That the the Tao that what did, what is the Tao that is spoken of? Is not the Tao? Are you am I making any sense here? Yeah, it's the ineffable, right? I call it I call it the thing because you know because it's also not a thing, <laughs> but um, yeah, the, and I think this kind of speaks to just how limited the mind is the mind literally can't and doesn't have uh the tools yeah. to go to these places we can only go to them in our hearts and our spirits and our bodies in some to some extent but the mind actually has to uh take its place yeah uh, maybe sometimes it's a place or a space one of my longest standing me uh, mentors calls calls it humpty right uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and when I hear people talking about ineffable, the ineffable um, or the uppercase S or whatever it is, uh, they they say it doesn't matter what it what, what we call it. And I say, yes, it bloody does matter what we call it, you know, but it doesn't. Right? You know, I think I think somewhere along the line, I've, I've, I've lost that frustration with the lack well, of. Some no. Some words are loaded. Some words are triggering, you, you yeah. know, to different people. But yeah, it's it's the it's really the empty space that we're alluding to. Yeah, and that that's the magic. If if Gabor Mott is talking about the the wisdom of trauma, this is the the wisdom of healing. The wisdom space of healing it, it's where it's that place of us that's untouched by the psychology yeah i you know when you when you were talking about that i i had this thought about um how we tend to frame things as good and bad and i i really worship at the altar of complexity because when you oversimplify, that's what you do for children so that they can digest things. But again, that's just a placeholder because it's just like, wait, kid, it gets more complicated. But but so many of us stay in that place and don't realize it's a placeholder, um, it, that it's an empty space where things can evolve. And so we do this with plant medicines, right? Like, oh, I don't want to have a, a bad trip. And, you know, we see trauma as bad. And it's not to say that it's ethically something that we want to condone um, or that it doesn't deserve much compassion and, and empathy, but there is this reframing that happens in the healing world where instead of saying something is bad, there's really kind of nowhere to go with, with that. You, you can really end up stuck in it and you know when you think about abusers and things like that but if you if you frame it as everything is a teacher you know because when my illness struck and I'm bedridden and miserable and in really agony 
um, I was really stuck in a place where it's just like, well, I guess this is my life, kind of a shitty life. And so it would end in a shitty death, like no surprise there. But when I started to reframe it and, and start to ask, you know, what is the teaching here? I began to see it as, and I see it now in other people, that people, some people, maybe all, at some point, the universe stages an intervention for them. Uh, in our culture, I think we call it the midlife crisis often. It doesn't always appear in that form. But it's just like, hey, your, your life isn't really your life. You're living by a script that somebody else wrote for you, and you've never really come into your authority. You're not writing your own life from your true place. And you can either bury your head in the sand, which a lot of people do, um, and it's not to blame them. Sometimes they just don't have the support, and and sometimes it is actually threatening. You know, it can be really threatening to be openly gay in certain countries. It's not like you can just, uh, you know, it's like Dave Chappelle's when keeping it real goes wrong. You know, you can't just keep it hundred percent real all the time. You you do have to. Um, there are rules to the to the game, and you can break them sometimes. But but it's it's again, it's complex. It's complicated, and so the more we can invite complication, and the more we can look at everything that happens to us as the potential catalyst for growth, that's where the healing is. Because if it's not there, I don't know where it is. Indeed. And the Dick Schwartz book is called No Bad Parts. Right. It's yeah. called No Bad Parts. There's also no good parts. In my view. Okay. Everything is. You know, it's like you say someone's a bad person. Well, what does that mean? It means we're judging them by their worst day. Someone's a good person. We're judging them, you know, by by their best uh, behavior. But they're actually just people. And they're people who are responding to the circumstances of their lives and the beliefs that they were given and what they believe is possible and not possible. And some of the quote unquote worst people are actually the people who deserve our compassion the most because they're actually the most wounded and the most blocked from their true essence. And so, I mean, you could also argue that we're all good people um, in some respect, uh, deep down you know uh, you look at you know pictures of hitler as a baby and no one's like oh my god we gotta you know get out your pitchforks it's like no it's just it's just a baby and people that's just a person and especially in writing when creating characters i mean this is why actors love playing villains um because they have to play them not without judgment and, and to go into those roles without judgment and to come into the role of you without judgment, that's a great practice. But ultimately, we are trying to embrace the complexity of our fullness, that we can be real jerks, we can be really selfish and self-serving, dishonest, and we can also be very selfless and so caring and really show up for people and ourselves. You know, and this is the Dick Schwartz thing where you know you just you embrace it all. And because if you if you isolate one of them, it becomes a demon, and it's uh and it's not good, yeah. and it makes other people's lives hard, and you don't get to learn from it. it. You you shut it off from being a potential catalyst for growth. Yeah, fantastic, and uh, and we've been talking about healing all the way through, but um, some people don't like the healing word, right? So um, growth is another word that uh, uh, that uh, people prefer, and evolving, evolution, I think like that. Uh, I, I just use the healing word because it, it's the it's the simplest. Yeah, I, I like the word uh, maturing because there really aren't a lot of mature human beings on planet Earth right now. Everybody's kind of a a toddler, and myself not excluded from that. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I think of healing, I really think of, of becoming an elder, really becoming an elder. 
fantastic. So I would urge everybody to check out uh, Miyok's um, website. Uh, this uh, the 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 bit from the Netflix uh, documentary I loved, and the and the bit from Gabor Mate on talking about you. I love that too. So thanks yes, for joining. And I, I was also on the Wisdom of Trauma, uh, one of the panels, and that's also on um, my website. Yeah, yeah, I've not found that bit yet. Thank, thanks, Mia, and thanks, listeners. We'll speak to you on racing. Take care. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. You too.